10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hello, my friends, and happy St. Patty's Day. Lancha, my friends. It's my favorite holiday. Thank you so much for coming to hang out with me this Sunday, March 17th, 2024. Today is St. Patrick's Day. I thank you so much for choosing to spend part of your day with me today because I know you have a lot of other options on YouTube. And I thank you so much, as always, for coming to spend some of your time with me tonight. So it's been a very interesting week. It's been a great day so far. The Rangers beat the Islanders, so that was good. I'm really sorry, Scott, but, you know, it kind of had to happen. Just glad I didn't have to be on the Long Island Railroad tonight after that came from Madison Square Garden back to the island. Whose birthday is it? It's somebody's birthday. Happy birthday, rehab department groups. Happy birthday. It's also uh, Brian from LTL True Crime's birthday, so happy birthday to him. How awesome that you grew up with a birthday of St. Patrick's Day because there was always a party on your birthday somewhere. Always a party on your birthday. Well, for those of you who are new here, I'm Melanie Little. I'm a New York State licensed attorney. I've been a trial lawyer for 30 years in New York State and federal courts. And I come to you today with some new developments on the Karen Reed case. And all of a sudden, everyone's jumping on this, jumping on the bandwagon here. We've been out here screaming into a closet for a long time. I started covering the, this case only in January of this year. I know I'm not the first to cover it, but I do have, this is my 14th video on this case, and I have about 30 hours of content already. So if you're not familiar with this case, Go back and get familiar with it because there is so much to it. We just can't even get it done in one hour, two hour, three hours because things keep happening. But if you know me and you know my channel, you know that we like to keep it classy here. So we will not tolerate, please, no cursey words, no personal attacks, no um, attacking each other, me, my moderators, no trash talk. And so here's what I'm going to say for tonight. Be nice or leave. It's really not hard. It's really not hard. We can agree to disagree and we can do it respectfully. And this is not a neutral channel. So if you want to go watch a neutral channel, there's plenty of robot channels out there that are now manned by AI, artificial intelligence, and you can watch those. But you're going to get my, um, you're going to get my uh, opinions, whether you like them or not. <laughs> I'm not a cupcake. I can't make everyone happy. I'm not a cupcake. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, I saw some people commenting on some other streams about my coverage. They didn't like it. I'm not, you know, I'm not seeing it fair. I'm not impartial. I, I don't have to be impartial. This is my channel. I'm going to say what I want to say. Okay. If nobody else wants to give me my own show on real TV. Then I'm going to make my own show, which is what I'm doing here. And I'm going to talk about the things that I want to talk about that I'm passionate about. And the reason I'm passionate about this case is because I've been following it since it first happened. And the more I see what is going on in this case, the more I realize that Karen Reed could be you. Karen Reed could be me. Karen Reed could be anyone. And that's why this is such an important case to pay attention to. And because corruption really does happen. It really does happen. I hate to break it to some of you people out there. But corruption in law enforcement does happen. I'm not saying all cops are bad. I back the blue 100%. 100%. I have law enforcement in my family. Always back the blue 100%. John O'Keefe was also a police officer, a Boston police officer. John O'Keefe is also part of the blue. Okay. I also am born and raised Long Island where we have had our share of police corruption during the Long Island serial killer case, which started in 2010. And because of all the corruption that happened in the Suffolk County PD and the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, the Long Island serial killer was never caught, despite the fact that they had a description of him in their case files since 2010. So I know about police corruption. I know about corruption in DA's offices. In fact, our DA, the Suffolk County DA, Tom Spoda, you can look it up, S-P-O-T-A, is still sitting in federal prison right now for the corruption that happened with 
police chief Jimmy Burke and some things that they tried to cover up. So it does happen. I know a lot of people don't want to believe it, but it really does and can happen. And it may be happening in the Karen Reed case. And based on the fact that we've just found out from the hearing I covered last Tuesday, March 12th, all of the things that Trooper Proctor, Michael Proctor, who was the lead investigator on this case, Trooper Michael Proctor of the Massachusetts State Police admitted in front of a federal grand jury, because yes, there's a federal grand jury investigating the investigation of the Karen Reed case by the district attorney's office in Norfolk County, Massachusetts, and the Massachusetts State Police, and the Canton PD. He admitted in front of a federal grand jury that during the state grand jury, which was used to indict Karen Reed, the defendant in this case, he minimized his relationships with the witnesses in this case, the Alberts, the McCabes. And now we have just learned the day after that March 12th hearing, it was announced by the Massachusetts State Police that Trooper Michael Proctor is the subject of an internal affairs investigation. So we're going to take a look at that. We're going to take a look at so many comments from my last video that we did on March 12th, which was the day of that hearing. So many comments in the on the video and in chat. We're talking about how you, the viewers, in your opinion, did not think that Judge Canoni was being fair to the defense and that you couldn't understand how this could be allowed to go on and how the judge could be allowed to rule this way and behave this way, et cetera. Many of you may not know that in July of 2023, the defense made a motion asking Judge Canoni to recuse herself, which means if you're not familiar with legal jargon, as Matt Bond likes to say, legal mumbo, mumbo jumbo. And Matt, did you just say that it's your birthday too? Happy birthday also to Matt Bond. Wow, you have an awesome birthday. St. Patrick's Day. Um, the defense made a motion to recuse, for Judge Canoni to recuse herself back in July of 2023. And a lot of you who are new to the case may not know that, or you may not remember that. But we're going to go over that tonight too, because now I've never done a show on the motion to recuse. I kept saying I was going to, but we never got around to it. But now that we know what we know now, to go back and look at that motion. It's very interesting to see the arguments that were made, to see what happened during that hearing back on July 25th of 2023. And a lot of things are going to be a little bit more evident to you now that we're going to go and look at what happened then, knowing what we know now. And so many people have said on television television. I mean, uh, do we call court TV and long crime mainstream media? I guess we do. If we are all, um, you know, fans of true crime, because that's where we watch our trial coverage, long crime and court TV. Unfortunately for me, I have um, Fios cable and they took it off. You can't watch it on cable anymore. You have to watch it on court TV's website and you can only watch it when it's live and they don't always post their shows right away. But it's a very divisive case. And you know, if you're local to Massachusetts, that this has divided the town in a lot of ways. And if you watch the chats on those other channels that I just mentioned, Court TV and Law and Crime, you will see a lot of vitriol, a lot of vitriol on both sides, on both sides. And tonight, uh, this show is not going to about, be about any side drama that's going on right now with anyone who's talking about this case, anyone who's involved in this case. I don't want to get into the weeds on that. What I want to do with you tonight is to look at the internal affairs investigation into Michael Proctor and what that means and why that is important and how that could affect the case. And also to talk about the motion to recuse that was heard in July and what happened with that motion and the hearing around that motion. And also the first thing I wanna talk about tonight is I wanna talk about the reason why so many people who don't, really know anything about this case, that have not read the court files like, like a lot of you have, who have not watched all the hearings like a lot of you have, thought immediately and still think right now that Karen Reed is in fact guilty, that Karen Reed did in fact hit Officer John O'Keefe with her car. 
And I'm going to submit to you that the reason for that is this. Immediately, when this case was first reported by the news, one second, it was reported in several news outlets. Now, this was February 2nd of 2022. 2 22 If you're into numerology, it's a really interesting number. It was reported right away that law enforcement had ring doorbell footage of Karen Reed hitting John O'Keefe with her car. And I thought I was crazy for thinking that. But so many of you kind viewers pointed out to me where to find it, and I did find it. So I'm going to show it to you now because it's still out there on the interwebs. Okay, so here is your local boss sensation, WBZ News, which is the CBS news station in Boston. This is their original article from February 2nd of 22, but it says here it was updated on September 8th of 2023. Although there were certain parts of it that were not updated because right here, right here, it says WBZ TV I team sources said investigators have video of the incident from a ring doorbell camera and Reed's car has been impounded. Where is that video? Where's that video? Here's another article from GBH Local News out of Boston. And this article was from February 8th of 2022. And it was updated August 7th of 2022. This was published the day after jo officer, Boston police officer John O'Keefe's funeral. And this is right here. This is written by Henry Santoro. And he's talking with some sort of legal commentator. Let's see how they introduce him. Daniel Medwed, who is a GBH News legal analyst and Northeastern University law professor who joined Henry Santoro, the host, on Morning Edition to discuss legal issues around the Karen Reed case. And this was right away. John O'Keefe's, Officer John O'Keefe's date of death was January 29th, 2022, as those of you know who've been following this. And this interview was done on February 8th. And there's an interview here with this law professor, and he refers to this direct evidence. Second, in terms of the direct evidence, he says, not only is there apparently some video footage from one of those ring doorbells on a nearby house that can capture images in front of your home. But she also made some inculpatory statements to both a friend and to a Canton paramedic to the effect of maybe I hit him, perhaps I hit him, I must have hit him. Well, at least he's getting the statements a little bit more correct instead of just saying I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. And he says, so there is quite a bit of, a bit of evidence, Henry, but it does all suggest that it was inadvertent that there was more of an accident than a purposeful event. Where's the video? There is no video. There is no video, but right away, a source from the investigation leaked information to the media, to the mainstream media, this is local Boston channels, that in fact, there was an actual ring doorbell camera video of Karen hitting John with her car, okay? So I don't know when David Yannetti was hired, but when he got on the courthouse steps and said something like there was no intent, there was no, at that time he was told there was a video, right? Open and shut, case closed. He was told there was a video, there was no video. And you know how we know that? And everyone, people say, um, you know, well, it, it, there could be a video. They just, you know, we don't know everything they have yet. Oh, we would know about that. We 100% would know about that because that would be the opposition to every single motion that the defense has made for third party evidence to dismiss the indictment. Well, what do you mean, Your Honor? There's a video. We have ring camera doorbell footage of Karen Reed hitting John O'Keefe with her car. They purposefully or negligently, 
I would say it was purposely leaked. I would say that the, the, the news organizations are negligent for having published it and it's still up there. And it's not just national, it's international because guess who else picked it up right away? And you know how this works. Everybody picks it up from everybody else. The Daily Mail, which is in the UK. This is an article from right away. This is February 2nd, 2022. The day that she was arraigned, first time she appeared in court. And this article also says there's video. So not only was it released nationally, it was internationally. Here's a picture of the snowbank. It says in this, underneath the caption of this picture is the detectives found pieces of the car Reed was driving in the snowbank. The off-duty officer was found responsive and pictured during the snowstorm. I don't know if this is the actual snowbank because I've never seen this picture before, but I thought that was interesting. This is a very long article. Investigators have footage of the ring, have footage of the incident from the home's ring doorbell camera but have not yet made it available to the public. It's right there. Right there. See, do you see what I see? If you're watching this on replay, I had to cut that out because of the copyright strike. They sent me a copyright strike. I don't think they will, but. Um, might be cut out. What say you, my friends? What say you? Hello, Melissa Smith. I missed your last super chat on the last live stream, which was very funny about playing the ball where it lies. Um, listen, I think they lied knowing they could say, oh, we meant the video from John's house and say it was just a mistake. I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, I think as somebody from the investigation leaked that to the media immediately. Thanks, Matt Bond, Bond, for your super chat. Yep, my birthday, spending it watching Spiffy, Legal, Mumbo, Jumbo, Talkie, friends. Thank you, Matt, for choosing to spend your birthday here with me. And Galen, thank you so much for gifting five memberships. And also, thank you too much, so much for the cash app, Maureen. Maureen, you're always in there. First one, first one with the, um, with the cash app, and I appreciate you so much. You guys are very generous on this case, and I really do appreciate you. So I think from the beginning, from the very beginning, the news reporting on this case was intended to make it so this was an open and shut case with video evidence, video evidence of the actual incident. Uh, and I find that to be curious and I find it to be curious that it's still out there. Why? Why? Why was there this immediate rush to guilty? And I think a lot of people who remember the initial coverage on this case still rem remember that. Investigators said they had a video of the incident. So people kind of were like, OK, open and shut. We're done here. But um, we're not really done here because the lead investigator in this case, Michael Proctor, is now investigated by internal affairs. And at first, when the news first broke on Wednesday, the day after the last hearing, it was reported that it had not been confirmed that he was being investigated with regard to the Karen, what was going on in the Karen Reed case. But since then, it has been. So let's take a look at some initial reporting on that out of Boston, NBC 10, because we can't really trust ABC anymore, you guys. I mean, CBS because CBS was the original Boston Channel who is still reporting on their website that there's ring doorbell video footage of the actual incident. Here's uh, NBC, Boston. 
New developments today in the Karen Reed case. State Trooper Michael Proctor, the lead detective in the investigation into the murder of Officer John O'Keefe, is now under investigation himself. The defense accuses Trooper Proctor of not revealing details of his relationships with people involved in the case. Our NBC 10's Abby Nascota joining us live in Denham with a refresher on this very complicated case, Abby, and all the players involved here. Yeah, a lot of moving parts and a lot of new developments, guys. We want to start with saying tonight state police will not say why they've launched this probe into one of their own. But law enforcement sources tell us that it is in direct connection to the Karen Reed case. So the question then becomes, well, what kind of impact could this have on a trial? Yeah, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. It's a big problem. We'll talk about that more in a second. I'll let this play out. The defendant, Karen Reed, killed John O'Keefe. Is she a killer or the victim of a cover-up? The car didn't hit him, and he wasn't hit by the car. The latest twist in the murder case against Karen Reed, putting the spotlight on the lead detective tasked with investigating it. State police confirmed Trooper Michael Proctor is the subject of an internal investigation, and law enforcement sources tell NBC10 Boston it's in connection to the Reed case. There is a level of closeness that cannot be overstated. The probe launched one day after Reed's attorneys pointed out text messages between Trooper Proctor and the owners of this home in Canton, where John O'Keefe's body was found outside. They say the trooper had a close relationship with the owners and they even offered to get him a thank you gift for getting them out of a legal jam. I could have some huge implications for the district attorney and their ability to be able to prosecute this case. Legal expert Shane Rodriguez says if the investigation finds any wrongdoing, the trooper's credibility could also be questioned in other cases. It could have an impact in later cases that separate and apart from the Brian Walsh. Brian Walsh. Didn't he also investigate the Brian Walsh case? The Karen Reed case. The bombshell coming as a blogger known for defending Karen Reed was back in court Thursday. Aiden Turtleboy Carney is accused of harassing witnesses in the case, but his supporters who held a protest outside the Norfolk District Attorney's Office say this is what it takes to expose corruption. We see the corruption where it lies and hopefully, you know, this this opens up a can of worms that, you know, people are investigated and the right people go to prison. With that, the trooper's alleged bias is a big reason why Karen Reed's defense wants this entire case dismissed. A judge here is yet to rule on that motion, but guys, right now, the trial is set to start on April 16th here. We're live outside Norfolk Superior Court in Dedham. I'm Abby Nez, go to NBC10 Boston. All right, Ab So the trial right now, as of right now, is still supposed to start on April 16th. I don't know that that's going to happen. Many things could happen before then. Uh, the case could be dismissed. There could be more arrests made. But as you know, Judge Canoni has been very, very adamant about this case proceeding on schedule uh, faster than it probably should because there's still so much stuff, you know, that hasn't been turned over. There's a lot of... Uh, there's been a lot of delays. There's been a lot of issues. And let's take a look at Proctor's attorney's statement. I thought that was the one I was going to pull up first, but I did not. So let's take a look at this. This is also from the same station, NBC 10 in Boston. Speaking of Karen Reed, by the way, we're also following new developments in her case. Tonight, we're hearing from the attorney for the state trooper who's been acting as a lead investigator in that case. And as follows revelations that the trooper is under investigation by state police. NBC10's Eli Rosenberg has been tracking all of the developments here, the twists and turns in this case. Joining us live from Canton this afternoon, Eli. Well, Cole, and that investigator's name is Michael Proctor. We are hearing from his attorney for the first time since that explosive hearing on Wednesday. He says Proctor is cooperating with both the U.S. attorney investigation and that internal affairs investigation being done right now by state police. And that Proctor stands by his work in this case and all cases. This evening, new twists and turns in a case that has captivated the region as the Karen Reed trial inches closer and closer. It's not like the OJ trial that everybody's watching. And while everyone <laughs> might not be watching, a lot of people are, especially here in Canton, where this story is set. Reed is accused of hitting her boyfriend, Boston police officer John O'Keefe, with an SUV in 2022 
outside this Canton house. I right. feel like it's uh, it's divided our town. I really do, because I mean, it's everybody has their side and their opinion. On Wednesday, Reed's attorney telling the court a federal investigation has found new evidence in the form of text. Text the attorney claims were between the lead state police investigator Michael Proctor, his sister, and members of the Albert family who lived at the home where O'Keefe's body was found. Now Proctor's attorney is responding, telling us, To be clear, Trooper Proctor remains steadfast in the integrity of the work he performed investigating the death of Mr. John O'Keefe. To the extent that Trooper Proctor's personal text messages are alluded in court proceedings regarding Ms. Reed, he respectfully submits that the objective investigative steps he and members of his unit took are in no way undermined by the content of the personal messages. Okay, so, I mean, really, what is he supposed to say? It doesn't mean anything that um, Julie Albert texted my sister uh, to text me to say when all this is over, she wants to get you a thank you gift, and I texted back, get one for my wife instead. Um, doesn't matter that maybe 10 days before John O'Keefe was, Officer John O'Keefe was killed, uh, that he was going to have Julie Albert babysit his toddler. None of that stuff matters. Doesn't mean that my investigation was in any way compromised or that my integrity is in any way questioned here, says Trooper Proctor's attorney. What say you? State police say Proctor is being investigated for a potential violation of department policy. And sources tell NBC 10 Boston it is connected to the Reed case. I don't think it's going to cost him his job. I don't think it's in and of itself going to uh, make the case go away. But it, it's uh, another grounds, another viable grounds for attack at trial, probably. I don't know. He's a law professor. So what do I know? I'm just a lawyer, but I disagree with him. It might make the case go away. What it's definitely going to do is make it so that he is going to be impeachable on the stand if he stands up. And he has to be put on the stand. He is the lead investigator in the Karen Reed case. There's no way that he cannot be called as a witness. He has to be called as a witness. And I watched another talking head say, well, you know, what will happen is the prosecutor will get all of that out there, you know, first before the defense cross-examines him. This is such a can of worm, you guys, worms, you guys, because once all this stuff comes out and he admitted to the federal grand jury that he lied in front of the state grand jury, the jury doesn't have to believe anything that he says. His credibility is shot. It's shot. All right. So it's important to note here, Proctor remains on full duty with the state police. While this internal investigation continues, his assignment has him assigned to the DA's office. And the DA's office here tells us he continues to receive his case assignments. Live in Canton, Eli Rosenberg, NBC 10, Boston. Okay, so he's still on duty. They haven't, have they taken away his gun and badge? He's still on duty for the Norfolk County DA's office. So, hey, guys, in Norfolk, Dedham, Norfolk County, I can see why you're protesting <laughs> the DA's office like they just showed in that prior news clip. I can see why. Because um, I'd be pretty mad, too. So, what? Yeah, he took no photos, says Map. He took no photos. The entire investigation is compromised. Yes, the Care Bear says... This makes me so sick. Professionals are, we are supposed to respect and trust. Sad for the good cops. Yes, it is. Uh, you're not allowed to accept gifts as an attorney. Uh, Jesse, hi, Jesse. Um, you can accept gifts as an attorney. You're not allowed to accept gifts as a public official, unless you report anything over $100, as we learned in the Fani Willis case and other cases that we've been covering. Judges are not allowed to accept gifts because that's improper. Um, and... As you know, we also covered the Massachusetts State Police corruption ring where there were certain Massachusetts State Police officers who were trading commercial driver's licenses for favors and for water and Swedish fish and plunge pools, driveways, mailboxes. Uh, so it's going on and it's going on right there in Massachusetts, not just here in Suffolk County. So it's the appearance, right, of impropriety. And we talk about that a lot. And again, if you didn't watch my coverage on the Fonnie Willis case, we talked about a lot that a lot there too. Although the judge in that case kind of split the baby. I haven't even got to talk about that yet, the decision on the Fonnie Willis case. But it's the appearance of impropriety. And that's a good segue for us to get into the original motion to recuse that was made by the defense in this case based upon certain 
people who came forward alleging that they had a personal relationship with the judge, that they could influence the judge. And uh, you're going to see what the judge in this case decided. Judge Canoni, we're going to watch the hearing because it's been a long time since that hearing. It was last July. But right now is a good time to take a little break to hear all about our sponsor of today's show. Did you know that the odds of falling victim to online crime are one in four? Online crime is soaring. It's time to get smart about online safety. That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura provides everything you need to protect your privacy, identity, finances, and your family in one easy to use app. Do you even realize how much of your personal information is already out there being sold by data brokers to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you? Well, if you Google yourself, you may find something like this. And it may shock you to know that your full name, home address, email address, health records, and even relatives, it's all out there. That's one of the reasons you need Aura. Aura shows you which data brokers are selling your information and automatically submits opt-out requests on your behalf. Not only does cleaning up this information reduce the amount of spam that you get, but it will protect you from hackers who could use the information to help them access your social media accounts, bank accounts, and other sensitive information. Aura also helps protect me and my family from online threats by providing antivirus and malware protection, a secure VPN with military-grade encryption, credit monitoring, spam call protection, parental controls, password management, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It's really easy to set up. And best of all, I get everything at one affordable price. With the family plan, Aura will help you protect your kids by blocking harmful content, managing how much time they can spend online, and providing you with peace of mind while they game with cyberbullying and online predator threat alerts. I value my privacy and my online safety, and I value yours too. So go to Aura.com slash Melanie Little to start your two-week free trial because you can't put a price on peace of mind. I've also put the link in the video description below. You can thank me later. It really is a great product. I use it myself, and I have to tell you that they've already removed my personal information from the internet. And starting at $12 a month, uh, it's really, how do you put a price on protecting your family? The other great thing that it does is if you have kids who game, it monitors something like 200 games that kids play, Minecraft, Fortnite, all those kinds of things. And it will alert you if your kids are being targeted by predators or if they're being cyber bullied, which really, I don't know of any other product that does that. And if my kids were still young and on gaming, uh, gaming all the time, it would make me feel really happy. Uh, to know that I could be alerted to that. So it's a great product. I, I stand by it. And, uh, you know, look, sign up for a free 14-day trial if you do decide to and and let me know and let me know what you think about it. So glad to have a sponsor and so glad you're all here with me tonight. Um, let me thank Julio Suave for his super chat. Thank you, Julio. How dare Proctor refer in his statement to Jay O'Keefe as Mr. John O'Keefe. That's outrageous. We are outraged. We are outraged. If you watched the, uh, the the hearing with me the other day, we are outraged. Yes, we are outraged. I'm, I didn't point that out, and I, I meant to. So thank you, Julio Suave, for pointing that out for me, because I did mean to point that out. Why is it that every time everybody mentions Officer John O'Keefe in all of the investigative documents, all the police reports, all the witness, witness statements, all the pleadings, the motions, it's always just Mr. O'Keefe. It's never Officer O'Keefe. I find it disrespectful, and it personally offends me. Thank you, Tammy, Truth and Justice, for your super chat. Aiden Garney brought the story to light and exposed the lies and corruptions. Now the movement to free count reading and expose the corruption in M.A. grows daily. Yep. You are correct. You are correct. True Crime Junkie, the OG. Thanks for being a, mem a member for one month. Yay. Love this channel, mods and chat. Thank you. We try. We try and keep it classy and we try and keep people from attacking each other. And somebody once said to me that they love this channel because it's finally a place where their 95-year-old mom can watch true crime with them. So uh, that is my um, catchphrase now. And uh, that makes me happy. 
Thank you, Richard, for your very lovely $20 super chat and saying, great show. I appreciate you so much. This is a volunteer physician, so any and all donations are happily accepted, never expected. Um, uh, Mermaid Mary RN, thank you for being a member for two months. It's here. You should collab with Brandy and Sean McDonough. Sean McDonough has already been on my show once. Go back and watch that show. It's in the playlist. It's so funny because I wrote Brandy Churchwell an email today because I know you guys have told me she has amazing charts and graphs and family trees, and I would love for her to come on and talk about it with me. So I'm sure she's very busy, and I have not heard back from her yet. If anybody has a direct line to Brandy, she's also she has a channel. I think it's called The 13th Juror, right? Um, let her know. Love to, love to have her come on. Helen, the Scottish llama. Hello, Helen uh, from Scotland. In the UK, the minute someone is charged, no one can discuss and speculate on the case in the news and social media. That is correct as well. And that's a whole different system that you guys have there. And it's interesting. Remember when uh, when we were looking for Kimberly Singler, the mother who uh, killed two of her children, tried to kill the third and then pretended it was a robbery and shot herself too? Well, she ran away and she got to the UK. And it was, they didn't find her until she was in the UK and none of those proceedings have been televised. You're right. We can't even get a photo of her in jail or in court or anything. Arlene, Melanie, isn't the judge putting herself in the spotlight of the FBI by continuing the trial? Listen, whatever spotlight they have on whoever they have it, it's already out there and um, it's already out there. And the investigation is ongoing. We did learn that the other day as well from that hearing. So what say you? Hope always. Melanie, did they ever release the photos of her SUV? I mean, I'm sure they must have taken a lot of pictures of her Lexus, right? I haven't seen them. Well, mm, mm, no, <laughs> I don't think they did. They didn't take any pictures when they towed the car from Dighton, where her parents lived, where she was with her car when she were Proctor. I think it was Buchanan who went with him uh, to Dighton to collect that car. They didn't take any pictures of the car before they towed it. And uh, that's why this internal investigation internal affairs investigation is so important because he's the lead investigator on this case. He signed the probable cause affidavit. So everything that was in the probable cause affidavit to have Karen arrested in the first place and then the charges upgraded to murder was because of his affirmations. He interviewed all of the witnesses initially. He lied about his personal connections to the witnesses that he was interviewing. He misspelled certain names on purpose. He, who had access to John O'Keefe's phone right away at the scene? Trooper Proctor, who had access to John O'Keefe's clothes and didn't turn them into evidence or log them into evidence for a few weeks until after the death of Officer John O'Keefe? Trooper Proctor, who was it who towed Ta Karen's car from Dighton? Trooper Proctor, he also had access to the taillight. He also had five undocumented searches of collecting taillight pieces and finding taillight pieces. And he also gave the order to request the geofence data of only Android phones of everyone who was in the house. Yeah, so it's a really big deal. The entire investigation hinges on his work or lack of work. And I'm just calling it like I see it. Been a trial lawyer for 30 years. I know how these things go. He's going to be put on the sand. He's going to be crucified on credibility. And nobody's going to believe a thing he has to say. Because he's already told a federal grand jury that he lied to the state grand jury. See how that works? Lying to a grand jury under oath is perjury. Perjury. Do you know who just got out of jail for perjury in New Hampshire? Kayla Montgomery. Kayla Montgomery, the wife of Adam Montgomery, who was just found guilty of the death of his daughter Harmony, was in jail for something like almost two years for lying to a grand jury about working at Dunkin' Donuts on, on the day that Harmony went missing. She just did two years in New Hampshire in a state prison for that. So that's what perjury can get you, folks. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. Now, let's go back, shall we? Let's go back in time to the motion to recuse Judge Canoni that the defense filed all the way back 
in July, July 17th of 2023. And this motion was filed because the defense felt that Judge Canoni Get my, let's get myself back here. Judge Canoni should be recused from the case because of those things that I mentioned before. Perhaps she had personal relationships with the McCabe's, a summer house. And perhaps there's the appearance there of impropriety. And perhaps she was delaying her decisions on all of the defense's motions because she had a bias. So let's take a look at some of this motion. We're not going to read the whole entire thing together, but it is important because these things have been out there and the allegations have been made since all the way back in July of 2023, which is almost a year ago. Basically, what they are saying here is that the defense re respectfully files the instant request for the recusal and or disqualification of Justice Beverly Canoni. The defense has uncovered disturbing extrajudicial statements by family members of material witnesses in this case, alluding to their family's personal connection and ability to influence Judge Canoni, which when viewed in light of recent procedural irregularities, engaged in by this court to the great detriment of Ms. Reed, undermine public confidence in the outcome of these proceedings and create the appearance of partiality such that a reasonable, disinterested observer might question whether Judges Can Judge Canoni can be fair and impartial in this case and requiring her recusal and or disqualification. So the motion goes on to say, I'm not going to read this word for word to you, but that this motion is made under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution and the Massachusetts Constitution and the Judicial Code of Conduct, which mandate disqualification when a judge cannot be fair or impartial or where her impartiality might reasonably be questioned by a disinterested third party. Okay, so it's not just whether the judge thinks they can be impartial. It's whether someone who's not connected to this case might reasonably think that the judge might be impartial. So it's sort of like the appearance of impropriety that we've been talking about in a lot of other cases. It's not just whether or not she thinks that she can be fair. It's whether or not an impartial person might think that she can be fair. And under the due process clause of the constitution, every defendant is entitled to a fair trial. And the argument here is that Karen, Karen Reed can't possibly get a fair trial based on this following information that we have learned during the course of our investigation. And here's what they have learned. As set forth herein, the following facts and circumstances attendant to this case provide more than a reasonable basis for a knowledgeable, disinterested member of the public to doubt Justice Canoni's ability to be fair and impartial in this case, requiring her disqualification. Number one, Sean McCabe, a family member of the seminal witness and third party culprits in this case, whom Ms. Reed has publicly accused of murdering O'Keefe, made extrajudicial statements to a local investigative reporter that his family has a relationship with Justice Canoni and the ability to influence her. And two, Justice Canoni has routinely refused to rule in a timely manner on defense motions while advancing and prioritizing motions filed by the Commonwealth and the very witnesses who have claimed an ability to influence her. And three, Justice Canoni denied Ms. Reed a full and fair opportunity to be heard on a critical discovery motion requesting records from members of the same family that claim to have a relationship with her. And four, Justice Canoni has now indicated through the clerk of the court in writing that she intends to deviate from procedure in Norfolk County Superior Court by choosing to keep this case 
with her so that she can rule on the Commonwealth's motion to prohibit extrajudicial statements by the defense in which she and the third party culprits have a personal interest. That was the gag order motion. In spite of the fact that she was reassigned to civil court, and this case is properly heard by the judicial officer currently assigned to the criminal session. As such, Ms. Reed's constitutional right to due process and a fair and impartial judge require that Justice Canoni be disqualified from these proceedings. Now, we'll look at a brief recitation of the facts relating to this case as set forth in this motion that was filed July 17th of 2023. And it's also important to point out that the Commonwealth did not oppose this motion. They did not file any written opposition to this recusal motion, which is very odd. And it's also important to note that this motion was filed July 17th and it was argued on July 25th, eight days later. So let's go through a brief recitation of these facts as set forth in this motion. This is defendant's motion. For those of you who say that I don't read the Commonwealth side, I've read a lot of the Commonwealth side, but in this case, they didn't file any opposition. So this is what we have. Ms. Reed sets forth a brief recitation of the facts attendant to this case for the purpose of giving context to the disturbing extrajudicial statements made by Sean McCabe in connection with this case, which support Ms. Reed's request for the disqualification of Justice Canoni. Footnote number one. Love to read the footnotes because there's always juicy stuff. Although this just says there's more facts in our Rule 17 motion. If you need more facts, go to the Rule 17 motion. The events that transpired on the night before O'Keefe's death on January 29th, 2022, are largely undisputed. The evidence in incontrovertibly establishes that on the evening of January 28th, 2022, the decedent O'Keefe, his girlfriend Karen Reed, Brian Albert, Nicole Albert, Jennifer McCabe, Brian Albert's sister-in-law and friend of O'Keefe, Matthew McCabe, and several other individuals met and enjoyed drinks at the Waterfall Bar and Grill in Canton, Massachusetts. As the bar was closing around midnight, the parties discussed going to Nicole and Brian Albert's residence, located close by a 34 Fairview Road, to continue the party and celebrate their son, Brian Albert Jr.'s birthday. Although O'Keefe and Ms. Reed were not well acquainted with the Alberts, the invite was extended to them by O'Keefe's longtime friend, Jennifer McCabe. Shortly after midnight, the Alberts, Brian, Nicole, and Caitlin, the McCabes, Jennifer and Matthew, and Brian Higgins, close friend of Brian Albert and federal agent with the Massachusetts Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, with an office inside the Canton Police Department, left the bar in their respective vehicles and drove to the Albert residence for the after party. Witnesses gave conflicting accounts regarding whether O'Keefe actually exited the vehicle and made his way into the Albert residence on January 29th, 2022. Ms. Reed has maintained that she dropped O'Keefe off at Brian Albert's residence, located at 34 Fairview Road, the Albert residence, just after midnight on January 29th, 2022, and frustratedly left without him when he failed to answer any of her calls, presuming that he had proceeded into the house for the party. Conversely, the Alberts and the McCaves have maintained that O'Keefe never entered the Albert residence. The theory advanced by the Commonwealth in support of the filing of the instant charges against Ms. Reed is that she became suddenly angry with O'Keefe outside the home of Boston police officer Brian Albert, placed her car into reverse, struck O'Keefe with her vehicle at 27 miles per hour, and shattered the right taillight of her vehicle before fleeing the scene. However, the photographs of O'Keefe's injuries, which are attached here too as Exhibit A, speak for themselves and are completely inconsistent with the Commonwealth's theory of the case. Photographic evidence of the injuries in this case clearly suggests that O'Keefe was beaten severely and left for dead, having sustained blunt force injuries to both sides of his face as well as the back of his head. Moreover, in addition to suffering numerous defensive wounds on his hands consistent with a brutal fight, O'Keefe also suffered a cluster of deep scratches and puncture wounds to his right upper arm and forearm which appear to be consistent with bite and or claw marks from an animal and are clearly inconsistent with a vehicular homicide. Indeed, significant circumstantial evidence suggests that Brian Albert's canine German shepherd, Chloe, was actually responsible for the injuries to O'Keefe's right arm. Although Brian Albert's attorney made representations in court, 
and in filings falsely claiming that Mr. Albert's dog, Chloe, had no history of attacking human beings. Newly obtained records from Canton Animal Control and the Canton Town Clerk established that counsel's representations to the public and this court were false. In fact, records obtained from the Canton Town Clerk established that Brian Albert's canine German Shepherd, Chloe, escaped the Albert residence mere months after O'Keefe's death and attacked not one, but two separate human beings. One woman was bitten on the arms, neck, and leg in broad daylight. The other woman was bitten on the left hand. Both individuals were taken to a hospital for treatment as a result of the German Shepherd's vicious attack. As set forth in lengthy prior court filings, Ms. Reed has also unearthed shocking evidence implicating third parties Jennifer McCabe and Brian Albert in O'Keefe's death. Footnote 2. Uh, and they are saying more evidence of that and more facts are in defendant's motion to Verizon for Brian Albert's cell phone records. And you can look there for more information, Judge, if you need to. Indeed, an analysis of the complete forensic image of Jennifer McCabe's cell phone by computer forensics expert Richard Green, which the Massachusetts State Police and Norfolk County District Attorney's Office withheld from the defense for more than a year, establishes that Jennifer McCabe, one of the Commonwealth's seminal witnesses, Googled Hoss Long to Die in Cold at 2.27 a.m. on January 29, 2022, three hours before she supposedly discovered O'Keefe's hypothermic body in the cold snow on her brother-in-law's front lawn. Those of you who are just joining, now that we have the benefit of retrospect, on Tuesday, it was revealed in court that the federal investigation has revealed that their accident reconstructionist who Did had, you know that the who has three PhDs, count them, three, the accident reconstructionist hired by the FBI, not even as a part of this case, just a totally impartial, has determined that a car did not hit John O'Keefe and John O'Keefe was not hit by a car. But the injuries that he sustained were not from a car accident. The Quantico trained FBI agent who analyzed Jen McCabe's records and cell phone has also determined in the federal investigation that that 2.27 a.m. search on Jen McCabe's phone actually did happen at 2.27 a.m. It actually did happen. So ask yourself, all of those people out there who say, this is a conspiracy theory and I'm part of the conspiracy and I work for the defense. But by the way, I don't. I don't know Karen Reed. I don't know any of the defense attorneys. I don't know anybody involved in this case at all. That did happen. Why would a person Google how long to die in cold more than three hours before John O'Keefe's body was found? It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, my friends. Miss McCabe subsequently took steps to purge this search from her phone before turning it over to law enforcement three days later. Who'd she turn it over to, everyone? Was it Trooper Proctor? The revelations from Jennifer McCabe's cell phone alone make Jennifer McCabe and Brian Albert prime suspects in this case. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Significant other evidence, too lengthy to discuss here, further implicates Jennifer McCabe and Brian Albert in O'Keefe's murder. Regardless, Ms. Reed's defense is clearly predicated on a third-party culpability defense in which Ms. Reed will and has presented significant evidence to establish that Jennifer McCabe and Brian Albert are implicated in O'Keefe's murder. Suffice it to say, even the appearance of ties between Justice Canoni and the Alberts and the McCabe families would undermine public confidence in the outcome of these proceedings and would violate Ms. Reed's constitutional right to due process by due process and a fair trial by an impartial judge. And here they set forth the recent claims by a member of the McCabe family that they are connected to Justice Canoni and can influence her decisions in this proceeding. On May 28, 2023, Jennifer McCabe's brother-in-law, Sean McCabe, made some extremely disturbing statements to a local investigative reporter, insinuating that he has a close-knit relationship with Justice Beverly Canoni and an alarming ability to influence her decision-making in this case. 
I'm going to break for a second to remind you that May of 2023 was when the federal grand jury was hearing testimony in this case about the investigation of this case. So the timing of these messages from Sean McCabe to Aiden Carney are crazy and probably not smart. Aiden Carney, also known as Clarence, Wood Emer Clarence Woods Emerson in Turtle Boy, is a local, local investigative blogger in Boston who, much to the dismay of Brian Albert and Jennifer McCabe, has reported significantly on this case, nearly 70 blog posts to date, and published numerous articles opining that Miss Reed was framed for O'Keefe's murder by the McCabes and the Alberts. A true and correct copy of Facebook messages exchanged by Mr. Carney and Sean McCabe, Matthew McCabe's brother, and Jennifer McCabe's brother-in-law, between May 26, 2023 and June 1, 2023, are attached here too as Exhibit 1. Throughout the exchange, Sean McCabe repeatedly threatens Mr. Carney for writing nearly 70 blog posts about this case and for inter alia, which means among other things in Latin, there's a Latin fix for the day, and for, among other things, exposing connections between members of the McCabe and Albert family and the lead detective assigned to investigate this case, Massachusetts State Trooper, Michael Proctor. However, on May 27th of 2023, Sean McCabe took his threats and taunts a step further and began intimating that his family has had a relationship with Justice Canoni, the justice actively assigned to Miss Reed's case in May 2023. Indeed, on May 27th, 2023, Sean McCabe posted a public comment on Clarence Woods Emerson's Facebook page, which has nearly 30,000 followers, stating, Quote, I just called in an order asking Judge Bev to institute a trial by combat order against you. They'll be coming to bring you to me any minute now, Clarence. End quote. In response, Mr. Carney took a screenshot of Sean McCade's comment and sent it to him in a private Facebook message asking, do you really have a, a line to Judge Canoni? The next day on May 28, 2023, Sean McCabe, knowing full well that he was speaking to an investigative reporter, unabashedly responded, quote, Auntie Bev, whose sea who side cottage do you think we're going to bury your corpse under? End quote. Thus, in the same breath that Sean McCabe threatened to murder a local investigative reporter because he was unhappy with the bad press coverage his family has been receiving, he refers to Justice Canoni as being part of the McCabe family and intimate, intimates personal knowledge about the location of her home that only someone close to her would know. The mere suggestion that the judge assigned to this case is somehow related to and aligned with the same individuals, which credible evidence suggests are the actual third party culprits in this case, should be deeply disturbing to this court, the public, and Ms. Reed. To be clear, Sean McCabe is related to Jennifer McCabe and Brian Albert, the very family Ms. Reed has shown through credible evidence is responsible for O'Keefe's murder. Moreover, Sean McCabe's insinuation that he and his family have a personal relationship with Judge Canoni is further legitimized by the fact that his threat contains accurate, personal, identifying information about Justice Canoni that absent some relationship would otherwise be unknown to Sean McCabe. Shockingly, it appears that the seminal witness in this case, i.e. the McCabes and Alberts, or at the very least their family member, possess intimate knowledge about Justice Canoni, including the fact that she owns a seaside cottage on the Cape. Indeed, as set forth in the attached declaration of Alan Jackson, Notarized deeds filed with the Barnstable Registry of Deeds confirm that both Sean McCabe and Justice Canoni own property on the Cape in Centerville, Massachusetts, and live less than four miles apart. They attach the copies of the deeds. Just thus, Sean McCabe's suggestion that he has a relationship or connection with Justice Canoni appears at least facially credible, given that they both own homes in a small town on the Cape less than four miles apart. Moreover, although McCabe's residence is located further inland, the closest beach access for both homes appears to be the very same, very small beach. Hmm. They want to say there's only two reasonable explanations as to why Sean McCabe would know that Judge Canoni owns a seaside cottage. Number one, he either knows her or has crossed paths with her on the Cape, or the McCabe's have taken steps to locate and obtain personal identifying information about the judge presiding over this case and communicated that knowledge publicly for the purpose of intimidation. 
Hmm. This threat was not limited to Mr. Carney. Rather, Sean McCabe sent this message to Mr. Carney knowing full well that Carney is an investigative reporter and his conversations and comments about Justice Canoni would be widely publicized on Mr. Carney's website. In fact, at the very start of his conversation with Mr. Carney, Mr. McCabe encouraged Mr. Carney to publicly share their conversation on his website, writing, quote, so if you want to talk to me, you're going to hear what I have to say first. Cut and paste this S all you want, Sally, but you don't have the stones to look me in the eye, end quote. Thus, Sean McCabe's threat to murder Mr. Carney and bury him under Auntie Bev's seaside cottage was meant to suggest that to Miss Reed and the public at large, Justice Canoni is family. She will back our play. Go to the chat for a minute and say, what say you? Would a person, a reasonable person, just looking at this case from the outside, think perhaps there might be some reason, oops, that this is improper? Thank you to Jesse for being a member for four months. And thank you to Noni Lady for being a member for four months. Best true crime channel. Love the cupcakes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bob C says it gives the appearance there may be a relationship. Right. And what we're looking for here under the law and the judicial rules is even the appearance that a person on the outside would look in and think maybe there's something improper here. Sharon says, uh, Proctor also delayed writing his summary of the investigations for weeks or months after they were done. Yeah, go back and look at the, um, the stream where I broke down all the witness statements, the dates that he did the interviews and the dates that he actually had reports typed up. And you'll see there was a very long delay there and none of those witness statements were recorded in any way either with video or audio or anything. <laughs> Melissa Smith says, so do you have to be the judge's twin sister to be too close to this case? Hmm. Hmm. So the motion goes on to say that uh, not only did Sean McCabe make these statements saying that he's got a personal relationship with Auntie Bev and the Seaside Cottage and all that stuff, and they are you know major players in the case, but that uh, Judge Canoni has shown substantially and increasingly she has delayed her decisions on the defense motions and she's denied Ms. Reed the opportunity to be heard. Prior to May 3rd, they argue, the defendant filed three significant Rule 17 discovery motions, which they thought were going to lead to exculpatory evidence. And they did, actually. Um, Rule 17 motions are motions that are made to obtain third-party discovery people from people that are not involved in the case. The three motions were, on February 2nd, 23, they made a motion to uh, for the animal control records to Canton Animal Control, and I think to the town clerk. It took uh, Judge Canoni 16 days to decide that motion. Then on April 12th of 2023, defense made a motion for Brian Albert's Verizon and AT&T uh, records from the cell phone carriers and for his phone and for communications between Jen McCabe and Brian Albert. And on April 26th of 2023, Defendants renewed their motion to compel discovery for critical items of evidence that had not been turned over for them to, um, to test. And as of this motions hearing in July, had still not decided on that motion. And that was a 72-day, that motion was sitting out there for 72 days without a decision. So what happened at the May 3rd hearing is the court heard the animal control motion and the motion to compel discovery, the items of discovery that they had not turned over for, I, I think it was clothing and the black box and all kinds of other things that the, the defense wanted to test. She heard that motion, but she said that I can't hear the motion on the cell phone records for Brian Albert, Jen McKay, because 
um, we need an evidentiary hearing on that. So what I'm going to do is we're going to set a hearing date of May 25th. You're going to come back on May 25th, and that's when we're, I'm going to hear all the evidence on why you think that I should grant you uh, subpoenas for Brian Albert's cell phone records to Verizon and AT&T and be ready to argue the motion on that day. So then what happened was on, um, you know, the Commonwealth agreed and they were going back and forth about, you know, Karen's part of team was going to fly a witness in from out of state, spent all this money preparing for this evidentiary hearing. And then on May 22nd, which was three days before this hearing was to be um, heard, without any notice to the defendant, uh, Brian Albert and Jen McCabe's attorneys filed a flurry, a flurry of motions to quash the subpoenas for their cell phone records. Judge Canoni decided that um, they needed to have a hearing on the motion to quash and set the hearing for May 24th, which was one day before they were supposed to have the evidentiary hearing where the defense was going to be able to call witnesses and the out-of-state expert to talk about why they need this very important discovery. So she sets this for May 24th. And on May 24th, from the bench, she grants the motion to quash the subpoenas and says, okay, now I'm going to hear your arguments on the motion. And the defense attorneys are like, but wait, you said that was supposed to be tomorrow. And she said, oh, no, I want to hear it today. So their argument is that that was completely unfair. And I have to say that I, that I do agree with that. Uh, I want to pull up a portion of this motion where they talk about the gag order motion because that's also part of this motion. This is still, as you recall, the motion to recuse that we are still reading right now. Going back to this uh, motions hearing on May 24th, the defense argues thus, Ms. Reed's counsel was forced to argue an extraordinarily factually complex and lengthy legal motion, which was not on the calendar for that day, without any notes or advance notice, denying her a full and fair opportunity to be heard on a motion with a very real and consequential impact on her ability to defend herself against murder charges. The court then set the case for another pretrial hearing on July 25th, 2023. Although Justice Canoni acted with the utmost alacrity in ensuring that the May 24th hearing concluded as quickly as possible, and Ms. Reed was denied the ability to call the very witnesses necessary to prove the disputed facts set forth in her motion, she was in no such hurry to rule on the motion after the proceedings concluded. Justice Canoni waited 27 days before ultimately die denying Ms. Reed's Rule 17 motion for cell records on June 20th, 2023. They then argue that the court has now made the unilateral decision to deviate from procedure and prevent the criminal session judge from hearing the Commonwealth's motion to gag Ms. Reed's attorneys. On June 9th of 2023, the Commonwealth filed a motion to prohibit prejudicial extrajudicial statements of counsel in compliance with Massachusetts Rule of Professional Conduct 3.6a, that was the motion for the gag order, requesting that the defense counsel for Ms. Reed be gagged and prohibited from making any statements about this case whatsoever to the press. The Commonwealth's motion for the gag order was noticed for July 25th, 2023, and thus was requested to be heard at the next pretrial hearing, which was already on the calendar in this case. But on June 25th of 2023, a mere six days after receiving the motion for a gag order, counsel for Ms. Reed received an email from Mr. McDermott with the Norfolk Superior Court stating, quote, the court needs a response to the Commonwealth's motion to prohibit extrajudicial statements. The clerk further indicated that Justice Canoni wanted to unilaterally, unilaterally advance the hearing on the motion for a gag order, which was properly noticed for July 25th to June 27th or tw June 28th a month before it was supposed to be heard. Notably, on the same day, Judge Canoni sought to advance the hearing on the Commonwealth's motion for gag order, which clearly benefits Brian Albert and Jennifer McCabe. She still had not ruled on Ms. Reed's Rule 
17 motion for cell records, which had already been under advisement for 22 days. So as you see, they're setting forth all of these ways in, in which they think that the judge has not been fair. They are intimating that it is also because of the personal relationship we, she may have with some of the players, in this case, the witnesses. And says here, when counsel for Ms. Reed pushed back and indicated that our office would need time to respond to the motion for the gag order, intended to appear in person and were unavailable on the dates proposed by the court, Justice Canoni indicated through the court clerk that her efforts to advance the hearing were done because, quote, she was looking to hear this while she was still sitting in the criminal session, end quote. Thus, because the defense requested to have the motion heard on the date that was already on calendar and the date noticed on Attorney Lally's motion, the court indicated through her court clerk that she would hear the motion for the gag order on 725 in the civil session rather than have the criminal session hear this, end quote. Notably, the press and the court of public opinion have not been friendly to Justice Canoni, Jennifer McCabe, or Brian Albert. Notably, Justice Daniel J. O'Shea is currently assigned to the criminal session and appears listed on the docket as the justice assigned to this case. They go on to point out that indeed the public has already lost confidence in this court's ability to be fair and impartial in this case. And judge, even if you don't see yourself that you can't be fair and impartial, other people outside of this case may think that indeed you are partial and not unbiased and that you can't be fair. And because of that, you should recuse yourself. Let's take a look at what happened during this motions hearing because it's a long time ago and you guys might not remember this. This is all the way back on July 20. All right. And there was Zoom problems and all kinds of other problems during this hearing. But let's take a look. It's only about a half an hour. So give me an opportunity to also take a look at the chat because I've been reading so much. I have not been able to take a look at the chat yet. All right. So we'll um, talk to Mr. Reddington, get a date. <coughs> I'm out the last two weeks in October. Okay. So we, yeah, and I'm on trial the last week of October, so I'll look for something the week before. Oh. This was the case right before uh, the Reed case was being called. Can you hear this okay? Let me know that you can hear the volume. Just give me a one if you can hear the volume. I typically don't like to turn on the closed captions because they are typically not accurate, but if you want me to have them on, I will. Let me know that you can hear this. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, next is docket number uh, 2282CR117, the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. Can I have those to identify themselves starting with the Commonwealth? Uh, again, Adam Lowe, Commonwealth. Good afternoon, again, Your Honor. Laura McLaughlin. You are unmuted. Good afternoon, Ms. McLaughlin. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Attorney David Gennetti and Attorney Ian Henshi from the Gennetti Law Firm on behalf of Karen Reed. Good afternoon, Mr. Gennetti. Good afternoon, Mr. Henshi. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Elizabeth Little from Merksman Jackson and Quinn LLP, also on behalf of Ms. Reed. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Alan Jackson on behalf of Ms. Reed. If you are just tuning in, we are re-watching the hearing from July 25th of 2023, in which the defense is arguing the motion to recuse. They are asking Judge Canoni to recuse herself in this case. And this is that hearing from July 25th, 2023. Good afternoon, Mr. Jackson. Good afternoon, Ms. Reed. All right. So, Mr. Jackson, I think I will hear you on your motion to recuse. Your Honor, if I may, uh, and thank you for that. Um, there are several matters on calendar. I just want to make sure that there are that we're in on the same page in terms of the order in which we address things. So the first thing I'll be addressing is the recusal motion that we filed uh, that's currently impounded. Uh, Ms. Little, if the if the court, uh, depending upon how that court, how the court rules on the recusal motion, that will perhaps beget additional uh, 
discussion about some housekeeping matters. There's about four motions that are on calendar, uh, some of which the, uh, the Commonwealth has uh, filed, including a motion to compel, our opposition to a motion to disclose the name of an investigator, the Commonwealth. I haven't seen that motion. You haven't seen that, the, the one dealing with, it's, it's, the court probably <coughs> is thinking of, of it in terms of the animal control motion. There was a, a request by the Commonwealth that they be given access to the animal control documents, but at the same time, they requested hmm. the disclosure of our expert uh, or experts that may review uh, those. That may review those. Uh, and will oh. All right, I know. All right. I don't think anybody said freed Billy Tibbetts during this hearing, but I don't know how why that whoever's running the Zoom room doesn't know how to put everybody on mute automatically when they come into the room. I don't know. All right. Uh, so we'll have to hold that motion, Mr. Clark. What are the others that you think are on the calendar for today? I think the court will probably want to address the Commonwealth's, uh, Commonwealth's motion for timely, a timely protocol, which was advanced a couple of days ago. We just got notice of it, I think, two days yeah, ago, three days ago. But I, yeah, it may have been yesterday. But I think what happened with that is Ms. Little had filed um, a privilege log. So That's she correct. filed a privilege log. And it so, makes it moot. Yeah, so right. with that, we're ready to move forward with the protocol. So okay. that doesn't need to be heard. And I'm not sure your other one does, but I'll have Mr. Clark pull it. What else do you think should be heard today? The only other thing is the, the Commonwealth's request for a gap. Yeah, so I think there's really just two motions. Right. So I'll address the- Go ahead, Mr. Jackson. With the court's motion, I'll address the uh, recusal motion issue and Mr. Unetti, my colleague, will address the gag, uh, the gag order motion. Okay, go ahead. Um, your Honor, to- set a baseline for discussion about a motion of this nature. Uh, I think we had to go back to some predicate rules in court and predicate rules in the justice system. The cornerstone, of, cornerstone of, of a just and an equitable system lies in the belief that every single individual that appears before the court has the same right to a fair trial. Chief among those rights enshrined in the Constitution here in Massachusetts and the Constitution in the United States is the impartiality and the neutrality of the judiciary. That's why we're here today. Anything less than that, and the system is rendered completely iniquitous. It's morally broken. But fairness and impartially, uh, impartiality by the court is not enough. In other words, the court can't simply aver that it's fair, that it's unbiased after, after doing some soul searching. That simply won't do under the current law in Massachusetts and the current law in the United States. For a motion of this sort, it's not our burden to establish that this court is actually biased or actually par uh, partial in some way, and we are not making that argument. I want to be very clear about that. Rather, the Code of Judicial Ethics mandates disqualification of any jurist in any proceeding in which either the judge cannot be impartial or the judge's impartiality might reasonably be con uh, questioned by the, a member of the public. In other words, or in the words of the appeals court, quote, actual impartiality alone is not enough. Our decisions and those of the Supreme Judicial Court have commented often and in a variety of contexts on the importance of maintaining not only fairness, but also the appearance of fairness in every judicial proceeding. And it's that latter point or that latter rule that brings us to court today. We have, through our motion practice, presented facts and circumstances that would and have given reasonable, disinterested members of the public a basis to doubt this court's fairness and doubt this court's impartiality. Again, that does not mean, and we are not stating or averring that this court is not fair or impartial. Only the court knows the answer to that question. But the facts we've presented unquestionably are such that the public might, and that's the key word. Karen's dad, I guess that's is it her mom as well. It's, oh, my cursor, oh, there's my cursor. The public might doubt the court's fairness in some regard. 
And that's all that's required for this court to do the right thing and step aside from this case. Those facts which we have averted, which we've presented, all of which are public, it's not anything that we've supplied to the court which isn't already in the public discourse, include the following things. Number one, the court's, at this point, pretty routine practice of not ruling on important defense motions in a timely fashion. We have a motion before the court currently that I believe, if I counted correctly, as of today is 87 days old and the court has not ruled on that motion. That's an important motion for us. It's a motion to compel and it deals with physical evidence, but it still has, the, the court still has yet to rule. That is in no, no small part patently detrimental to the defense, to our moving forward with the defense case and our preparation. And it's a predicate of a fair judiciary that decisions are made promptly and without any undue, undue delay. That's contrasted, Your Honor, against the court regularly, apparently, ruling on motions that directly benefit the Commonwealth. Like when the court immediately ruled from the bench and granted two motions to quash subpoenas that favored Brian Albert and Jennifer McKay. For those records, there was no delay. For that request, or a series of requests. Please turn off your audio. Somebody playing like clown music on the on the Zoom. Go ahead, Mr. Chips. Best laid plans, right? Um, for the request that I just mentioned about the the, the quashal motions, uh, there was no delay by this court. The, the court made the rulings from the bench, uh, and that made the public, in public commentary, question the court's motives. In fact, the court has has unilaterally sought to even advance certain motions that the Commonwealth has presented. May I? Try again. <laughs> the court has unilaterally sought to advance motions that have been advanced by the Commonwealth while still not ruling on motions that we've had before the bench for not just days or weeks, but now months. And the dis it's the disparity in that treatment. Look, I, I don't disregard the fact that the court is a very busy court, that the court is a supervising court. The court has a lot of balls in the air. It's the disparity between the court's rulings in terms of the Commonwealth's motions and the defense motions that I think give the public pause, and that's where we need to, to start our analysis. Number two, the court seems to have deviated from the normal course of procedure, uh, in this case, in order to specifically stay on the Karen Reed case. Uh, and the court only made that known, or at least known to us, to the defense, after the Commonwealth filed a request to gag the defense. Uh, the optic is that the court had or has a personal interest in ruling on that particular gag motion, which is on calendar today, and wants to keep control over this case. That move has also prompted the public to raise questions about the court's fairness. Why is that happening? Uh, and it has eroded public confidence in the system, at least insofar as this case is concerned. Number three, the court outright denied Ms. Reed a full and fair opportunity to be heard at the court calls the last time we were here on a critical Rule 17 motion. And that motion was from records, importantly, from the very same family that now claims to have a personal interest and a personal relationship with this court. Uh, troublesome allegations, troublesome claims by the family at the very least. And that brings me to the final point and dovetails into that final point. Sean McCabe, a member of the McCabe family and a brother-in-law of Jennifer McCabe, whom we have argued in this court, should have at least been a suspect or a citizen. You're going to show that this way, Ms. Little. Why don't you show it to me? Thank you. Sean McCabe. Every time she says Ms. Little, I'm like, what? Okay, for the record, I have no relationship. I am not related to Eliza Little, Elizabeth Little, the associate for Mr. Jackson's office, who's also on the defense team. No relation. I don't know if you can see the, the screenshot of this exhibit, which is on poster board 
foam board, as we call it. It's a trial exhibit. At the top, it says Sean McCabe, and it's got a little, this is like a Facebook Messenger printed out. It says, do you really have a line to Judge Canoni? And that's Aiden Carney's message to Sean McCabe. And Sean McCabe says, Auntie Bev, whose see who seaside cottage do you think we're going to bury your corpse under? Made a claim to a reporter in public claiming to have a personal relationship with this court. And he tried to prove it by citing to the fact that Sean McCabe knows personal information about the judge, which is extremely troubling, about a beach home, not just the fact that the court may own one, but exactly where it is. His words were, after uh, receiving his, Sean McCabe's words were, after receiving a question from the reporter, do you really have a line to Judge Canoni? His answer was, Auntie Bev, and I mean no disrespect, I'm quoting. Auntie Bev, whose seaside cottage do you think we're going to bury your corpse under? Extremely troublesome dialogue, but it's not just the threat that's inherent in the dialogue. That's on one level. It's the fact that this person claimed to know that this court may own a beachside cottage somewhere. Your Honor, I, I, I will say I've appeared before hundreds. I, I, at this point, I'm getting old. I may have appeared before thousands of judges in my nearly 30-year career. I've never, ever known where a single one of them has ever lived or property that they may or may not have owned. But Sean McCabe appears to know, and he appears to intimate that he knows the details of this court's personal life. And it was his family that benefited by the cancellation of the evidentiary hearing. And it was his family that benefited from the court's quashal of our subpoenas. That claim by a McCabe family member of a personal connection to this court has been the fodder, Your Honor, of myriad public comments and questions about this court's ability to maintain fairness over this particular proceeding. And if that weren't enough, that offense has recently, just recently, received information that another witness, a similar witness for the prosecution, by the name of Julie Nagel, who was in Julie Nagel. Okay. I don't know if you've seen this, because when I went back and watched this, I forgot about it. Maybe I never saw it, but this was not mentioned in the paper. This is a receipt on Venmo, on Julie Nagel's Venmo. Julie Nagel was in the house the night that Officer John O'Keefe was killed. She's a friend of Brian Albert Jr., her brother, Ryan Nagel, pulled up behind Karen, and according to him, he was going to pick up his sister. She ran out. She said, I don't need a ride home. I'm going to sleep over. You want to come in? He said, no. Ryan Nagel's really the only witness here who's not related to anybody else in this case, and he's an impartial witness. He, was, he, was, he pulled up behind Karen, who had pulled up in front of 34 Fairview. He says that when he pulled away, he saw Karen sitting in the car alone looking at her phone or something, and the interior light was on. He did not notice a broken taillight. Julie Nagel is his sister. So does anybody remember this? Because here it comes. It's Julie Nagel. That's why I don't like the closed captions. So it says, Julie Neighbor, who is Julie Nagel? It's Julie Nagel. N-A-G-E-L who was inside the house at 34 Fairview on the night of John O'Keefe's death, apparently some five months after John's murder, and this is all public. We didn't have to do any digging and searching with, with subpoenas or other things. This was all public information. She used a Venmo app to pay for what appears to be a beach house rental, and the receipt of the recipient <coughs> on the Venmo payment reads Frank and Beverly. A beach, he says there's a Venmo receipt on Julie Nagel's Venmo that is public. That says it appears to be a beach house rental. And wait till you see what it says. Drum roll, please. I can't get the cursor over there, uh, Peter Estrada, or I'd highlight that. That's a public payment. It was there for all the world to see. And as soon as a reporter picked up on that, which is how we found out about it, and publicized that, she immediately took that payment down and took it off. 
She immediately took it down, took it off the internet. It says, Julie Nagel paid Ryan Nagel on June 22 of 2022. And it says, Frank and Beverly. That's the reference, Frank and Beverly. Alan Jackson is saying that appears to be payment for a beach house. And he's suggesting that it's Beverly, Judge Canoni's beach house. Is Beverly's husband named Frank? Because I don't even know if it gets this far. But it is spelled B-E-V-E-R-L-E-Y. And we know that Judge Canoni's name is B-E-V-E-R-L-Y. June 22nd, 2022, a payment Julie Nagel made to Ryan Nagel for Frank and Beverly. Off the internet. Obviously, I have no indication whatsoever, and I do not stand before this court suggesting that there's a connection. What I, am I can't to, see that one, Miss Little. This is simply a, uh, a screenshot. Could you bring it closer? I did. I have not seen the previous one, Miss Little, just held, held up. I know you. <laughs> First of all, oh my God, oh, she's freaking out right now, right? Is she freaking out right now? Second of all, I know a lot of you who are watching have been in that courthouse. This was in July. Does the, is there air conditioning in that courthouse? Because everyone in this courtroom is like, they are sweating bullets. Kim O'Brien says, yes, Frank is her husband. Um, Mr. Glock, 54, says her husband is Francis, if I'm not mistaken. Frank can be short for Francis, absolutely. Okay. The other one with your... What you're looking at is a screenshot of her having taken down that Venmo okay. payment after it became publicized, which obviously looks somewhat suspicious on her part. Um, these are all instances that have been the subject of public discourse, not just the defense team sitting in a room pontificating. This work, every single one of these instances has been something that has been in the public discourse. And the public is questioning this court's ability to maintain fairness given the panoply of information that is now before it, all in public documents that we happen to be privy to because we're part of the public as well. Nothing that we had to do any deep searching for. Your Honor, there has been an undeniable erosion of public confidence in this court's ability to be fair. But let me be very, very clear. The decision to recuse or disqualify a court due to the appearance of impartiality is not an indictment of this court's competence or integrity. It is not an indictment of this court's character. Nowhere close, and we do not avert that at all. Rather, the decision should be an expression of the unwavering commitment that this court has to justice, to fairness, to the rule of law. That's all. By taking this principled stance, the court will be safeguarding the core tenets of our justice system. Actual impartiality is not enough to deny this motion. If there's even an appearance of partiality, this court, according to the law and to the rules of judicial ethics, must grant this motion and disqualify herself. We simply ask the court not to let this perception cast a dark shadow on the scales of justice and over Karen Reed's right to a fair trial. I'll submit. Okay. Does okay. the comment want to be heard? She heard that. Okay. Okay. All righty then. Um, hmm. The Commonwealth did not oppose this motion on paper. They had no opposition to this motion, which is interesting. So now she's going to give Lally an opportunity to get up and talk. And remember, this is all the way back in July of 2023 when this motion was heard. So we are rewinding. We have the benefit of knowing that everything, everything that's happened since July 20, 25th of 2023. And if you don't know what happened, go back and watch all the other videos I did on this. There's about 30 hours of information and discussion and analysis court documents, et cetera. So let's see what Mr. Lally is going to say in response. Just briefly, Ron. <clears throat> Again, just briefly, uh, as far as uh, this course of partiality, uh, I personally do not, nor have I ever uh, even had a question in my mind as far as the court's ability to remain fair and impartial in this or any other case. 
as it pertains to uh, the standards. I don't think they can hear no, you. I, I so apologize. No, I saw your client and I interrupted Mr. Lally. Is, so. is it possible that he could uh, address the court from the podium? Yes. Your Honor, let me start again. And then first, I just want to impart that uh, I personally have, have do not nor have I ever had any questions, even, even a moment of pause in regard to this court's ability to be fair and impartial on this or any other case. As the court is well aware and was recently uh, reiterated by the appeals court, the Mitchell case, uh, there's two prongs uh, as it applies uh, to this. Uh, first, as counsel alluded to, uh, the subjective determination by a judge uh, believing that they can be impartial. Uh, and secondly, an objective appraisal of uh, whether this uh, is a proceeding in which uh, the court's impartiality might reasonably be questioned. And I think the operative word there is reason. The support of the, the motion, and, and let me be clear that uh, whether the court, Your Honor, chooses to uh, retain jurisdiction of this case or passes to another judge to retain jurisdiction of this case or passes uh, from judge to judge as the judges rotate in and out of the session, really is of no consequence uh, to the Commonwealth. Uh, but what I would say is that, uh, again, that, that operative term uh, being reasonable, and the, and the three sort of key things uh, the council seems to uh, want to hang their hat on is essentially uh, the first being uh, some conversation between uh, two individuals who have literally nothing to do with this case, uh, who talk about this case in an online discussion. And there's a great many things that are said in that online discussion, but we seem to be focusing on just this one thing and accepting this is true because this is what this person said. Whereas there are a great number of other sort of uh, defamatory things that are said by this person, Mr. McCabe, uh, in reference to this uh, blogger. Um, and we're not jumping to the conclusion that any of those things are true. Uh, I don't know whether they are or they aren't, but I'm, I'm just saying that we're focusing uh, in on this one particular thing. From that attachment, uh, the council filed as far as that conversation, which uh, is veered to be a true and accurate copy of that conversation, but it's not appeared to be a complete uh, transaction of that conversation. But from what's attached, uh, I direct the court's attention to page six, in which Mr. McCabe int intimates in there uh, that he doesn't really know anything about the case. Okay. Additionally, I would direct the court's attention to page nine. Well, I think it's pretty clear from there that the recipient of these uh, communications, this blogger, doesn't even believe Mr. McCabe himself and his environments uh, that he knows the court or is familiar with the court. Or has okay, that doesn't matter. Whether Aiden believes it or not, it doesn't matter. This is the appearance of impropriety that is important for this judge to be impartial. So Lally has a way of doing this. Word salad. He talks about things that are kind of like, look over here, look over here. Yeah, he does talk in circles, Maureen. I agree. Uh, I am dizzy too. I know it's almost over. There's not much longer. So uh, we're going to see. And then surprisingly, the judge is going to rule on this from the bench, which she never does. Has any influence over the court. And lastly, from that attachment, I direct the court's attention to page 11. Uh, in which it references uh, earlier posts uh, by this blogger about the judge. And that's, again, I think we're looking at this divorce from the context in which, this, in which this communication arises. This is not something that Mr. McCabe just generates out of his own head as far as, uh, along with a litany of other assertions that he makes in reference uh, to this blogger, but it comes from prior posts and prior uh, communications that were expressed by this blogger of already intimating impartiality by the court just in reference to adverse rulings, which brings me to my second sort of underpinning of this motion being that uh, the court has, I guess, adversely ruled or denied motions uh, that were filed by the defendant. I don't really see that as being any sort of valid basis for uh, judges to accuse uh, themselves. Otherwise, you know, every time a judge denies a motion, then we're going to have to find a different judge because they don't agree with me. And in particular, they're pointing to a motion which had absolutely no basis in the rules of criminal procedure whatsoever as far as having an evidentiary hearing on a Rule 17 motion. And the third thing as far as deviation from uh, procedure of the Norfolk Superior Court, there are a number of cases uh, that different judges might uh, hold on to for a period of time. They might uh, assign themselves to or be assigned to to retain jurisdiction. And the court 
you know, hearing this motion or any other motions in this case going forward, regardless of whatever session uh, Your Honor is, uh, is assigned to, it's really of, of no consequence and it's really not anything that's out of the ordinary, uh, as evidenced by the case that was called prior to this case, uh, which is a trial uh, that was conducted before Your Honor last November of a co defendant. There's a scheduled trial date coming up in this November of a, a co defendant from that prior trial. Uh, it's not an abnormal thing uh, for this court or any court to do. For those reasons, uh, again, I would pray upon the court as far as the decision is concerned, but as far as the Commonwealth is concerned, there's uh, no request for the courts to recuse themselves, and whatever judge hears the case is whatever judge hears the case. Thank you. Do you want to respond, Mr. Jackson? Very, very briefly. The only thing I would uh, draw both the Commonwealth and the court's attention to is the, the person that made the statement, Sean McKay, is related to Jennifer McKay. He's a brother. Um, he also didn't just throw sort of a dart at an empty dartboard. He hit the target because he made a claim that he had a personal relationship with this court, or at least his family had a personal relationship with this court. And that turned out to be at least some of the facts that he made or that he claimed in, in the uh, post turned out to be true. Uh, and we attached that. I'm going to be delicate about my comments here because it's sealed, uh, and it should be sealed. That portion should be sealed or impounded. But it turns out that it's true, and the courts had access to had an opportunity to see that. Um, also, with regards to the second post, it's also true in terms of the family members' names. It's not like they're just true what? the family members' names, okay. this court's family members' names, which I don't need to repeat here. But the, the fact, there is some fact based information he's saying that yeah your husband's name really is frank so you know that's troubling to us that troubled us because it turns out to be somewhat true now the last thing that i'll say is that the commonwealth's position was it may not be true there's a bunch of infectives in that uh string of, of communications between the investigative reporter and sean mccabe and half that stuff may be true and mr lally's words were i don't know if they're true and that's the point. He doesn't know if they're true. I don't know if they're true. I hope they're not true. I'm, I desperately hope that what Sean McCabe said is not true. But it doesn't matter what I think. It's matter, it, it only matters what the public perceives might be the case. And the word might is in the rule. It doesn't have to be the case. But a right. reasonable person. What the public might perceive, what a reasonable person looking outside, looking in, would perceive. That is the rule. Looking at this from the outside, looking in, if they're disinterested, might they think that the court has some relationship that it, that would compromise the court's uh, ability to be fair? That's enough. And at that point, it triggers this court's uh, requirement to disqualify itself. That's all. We're not suggesting that the court is not fair nor impartial, uh, sorry, nor partial. We're suggesting that the public may perceive it that way and they reasonably have perceived it that way. And I'll see you. Okay. It's 2.35. I'm going to take a 15, 20 minute break to consider what I've heard here today. Obviously I've read everything in advance, but let's take care. All right. <laughs> Okay, so she takes like a 15 minute break. There's still another motion to be heard, but she decides that she wants to decide this one right now, despite the fact that there's other ones out there that have been out there for 72 days that she hasn't ruled on. Another one, 27 days, another one, 16 days. Um, quick thank you before we get to her decision. She's gonna rule on this from the bench and you know, we, we're here for it. Uh, even though it's happened all the way back in July. Thank you so much, Carol Mary for the Venmo. That's a very significant number. I appreciate you so much. Jay from New Hampshire buying me a coffee. Thank you. And Janelle for buying me three coffees. Janelle, you know I love all that caffeine. Thank you guys so much. And I already thank Maureen for the uh, cash app. So thank you guys so much for your support. You are amazing. She's taking her little break and then she's going to come back. Okay. And she's back. Did I get a response to whether or not there's um, if, whether there's air conditioning in this courtroom? Because she looks sweaty. Okay, watch. Your 
Your Honor, we're back on the Karen Reed matter, 22117. All right, thank you. So I appreciate the arguments of counsel. I've considered those arguments. I've considered the pleadings, the motion, the attached affidavits, the big pack of attachments uh, to the motions. I've considered those placards that were shown here today. Uh, a couple of placards, they're trial exhibits, number one. Number two, she's very, watch her demeanor, watch her tone, watch her voice is very shaky. She's speaking all of a sudden. Well, she usually speaks softly anywhere, uh, uh, anyway, but watch her right hand start shaking. Just be, watch this. I don't want to stop it again to tell you, but just watch when she's holding her glasses. Watch, and then I want to know what say you couple of them I hadn't seen before. Um, yeah, a couple of them like the Venmo. So the defendant raises four discussion points in their motion. Uh, there's some claim delay in my rendering decisions. There's dissatisfaction with adverse rulings and alleged impropriety of retaining jurisdiction. But notably, there's some allegation that I have some relationship with a man named Sean McCain, and that therefore I have a connection to this case, and therefore I have a bias in favor of the common. That simply is not the truth. I can assure all parties that I don't know Sean McCain. As far as I know, I have never spoken to him or had any contact with him. She said she doesn't know them. No. I've never interacted with him and I certainly never have socialized with him or with any family members or any witnesses whose names have been said here in court or who are in the pleadings. In this last one, I think the person's name on the placard that was held up was Julie Nagel. I do not know her. I have never rented my house down the Cape to anybody. And I don't spell my name the way it was spelled on the placard. And I. Okay, okay. Because somebody misspelled her name, um, that means it absolutely did not go to her. Just like all of the witness statements were misspelled on Trooper Proctor's witness statements, like Sarah without an H and other things that I could point out. But now, now we're going to really point out a spelling error, Frank and Beverly with an EY at the end. It's the appearance of impropriety. It would just be so easy for you to just say, look, I don't know these people. I don't know Julie Nagel. I don't know why she put Frank and Beverly in her little Venmo app. But you know what? It doesn't look good. And even though I don't know these people, I'm going to step away from this case. Because what's important for the people of Norfolk County is the appearance of impropriety. And even though I don't know these people, I'm going to walk away from this case. I'm going to assign it to another judge. Peace out. Goodbye. Would have been easy to do. But but wait for it. I think Council are well aware of that. And doesn't that underscore the fact that anybody can say or write anything and try to make it the basis of a motion to recuse? Or try to make it the basis of throwing someone in jail for 90 days? Just saying. And I think it points out that this motion to recuse is not credible. There's no actual lack of of impartiality, there is no reasonable or credible appearance of lack of impartiality. And I want to make it very clear that I reject the notion that untrue and unsubstantiated rumors spread on the internet can force a judge to recuse herself from a case. Simply because someone plays with my name or gives credence to those who do um, by holding up a placard, you can't create a reasonable, incredible appearance of lack of impartiality. 
I'm sure counsel's aware that prior to me becoming a judge, I spent my entire professional career representing criminal defendants in very serious cases in the courts of Massachusetts. I know full well the importance of a fair and impartial judge. The Massachusetts Declaration of Rights makes sure that every citizen who appears before the court has a fair and impartial judge. And I know full well how to follow my oath and comply with my ethical obligations. All four points raised in the defendant's motion are without merit. The motion is denied. I will have written findings by the end of today summarizing what I've said here. And I will give you, Mr. Jackson, whatever time you need to appeal this decision. How much time do you think you need? Yes. I'm not a body language expert, but I watch a lot of body language experts. The licking of the lips, the shaking, the shaky voice. How much time do you need to appeal this, Mr. Jackson? You can appeal it if you want. Thank you for that invitation. We're not inclined to appeal at this point. We'll All right, Mr. Yannetti, Mr. Yannetti, I will hear you. I'm sorry, Mr. Lally, I will hear you on the... Okay, and then she moves right on to the gag order motion. Motion denied. Are you surprised? But did you remember that this happened all the way back in July, July 25th of 2023? Yes. Somebody said uh, you make a motion to recuse in front of the judge that you want to recuse. And yeah, uh, they get to, to uh, um, decide it. And then they are you are permitted to appeal it. And they chose in this case not to appeal it, which was a strategic decision on their part. But also... Um, We'll see how that pans out. I don't know what's going to happen here. Um, but how easy would, have, would it have been for her to just say, why did she want to keep this case? Why? Look at the Mishigas that it is now. Um, that means mass in Yiddish. For those of you who don't know, that's a, a New York uh, kind of word that we use. So um, it's the Mishigas. And why she would want to be involved in this, I have no idea. Why she was transferred to civil court. Why is she keeping this criminal case? She she was a defense lawyer before this. And so therefore what? That means that she doesn't know Sean McCabe and she never rented her beach house to Julie Nagel. The whole thing from the outside looks improper, whether it is or not. And the correct thing for her to do would have been to say, you know what? I'm, I'm going to step aside because it just doesn't look good. <laughs> A laundered hammer gaslighter, gaslighter says, gaslighting, gaslighter says what? Yeah. So that happened all the way back in July. And that's why so many people are so infuriated about this case. If you're still out there believing that Karen Reed really did it, I say to you, where's the ring doorbell footage that the investigators and the Commonwealth promised you on February 2nd of 22? 2 2 22. We looked at the articles, it's out there. They said they had ring doorbell footage of Karen's car hitting John. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Because if it existed, that would have been their response to every single third-party culprit motion that we've gone over in this case. And we've gone over an awful lot of them. Let me thank everyone in here from the Super Chats before we, we wrap. Uh, let's see, my friends. Thank you, Lizzie Bones, for your super chat. Look at the crew sitting straight ahead. Yep. Shauna Banana, thanks for being a member for three months. If K KR gets off, can she get back lawyer fees? Is she can sue civilly if it's shown that this was a false prosecution and she can try and get her attorney's fees back? The answer would be yes. She'd have to sue to get them back. NDF, thanks for your super chat. Canone has been unscrupulous throughout this whole thing and made sure... There is no other judge that hears this case. As a lawyer, how is she allowed to be this blatantly manipulative with no repercussion? Well, how about as a judge? As a ju well, you saying me as a lawyer or she's a judge? Um, look, they could have appealed it. They chose not to. There could be repercussions down the line. Let's just say if some of this stuff fleshes out that the FBI has uncovered. Um, Let's hope they're not investigating whether or not the beach house was really rented to the Nagels because that, my friends, would be even more of a tangled web than we're already seeing. What's that Billy Joel song? Because, you know, I think in song lyrics and it says something like, and we all go down together. 
think it's maybe the Down Easter Alexa. But I keep like, I kept hearing that in my head as I'm listening, I'm listening to this argument. I'm watching her sweat. We all go down together. DK, is it fair for a judge to decide a motion to dismiss a case with facts against that judge? Shouldn't it be a different judge? Doesn't seem like the judge would rule against themselves. Nope, it doesn't. I think I just explained that, but thanks for the question, D. Thanks, Sarah Harvey, for your super chat. Thanks for keeping closed captioning on. Great show tonight. Thanks, you guys, for watching. Mandolin Wind. We've been having uh, we've been having chats. We've been having chats in the comments. I said your song reminds me of a Bruce Hornsby song. Thanks for the 10 bucks. Attorney Melanie Little, wicked smart. Wicked smart. Scott McGinnis, thanks for coming in with the super chat. Beverly Canoni, aka Auntie Bev, no longer tolerates. Chalks being presented in open court by the defense. Oh, the good old days. CW is doomed, though. Donovan, have you ever claimed a judge is potentially compromised in open court, Melanie? Nope. Never have. Nope. Never have. This doesn't happen often, you guys. This is this entire case, everything that's happened in this case is like rare and never, pretty much. Uh, this is a crazy, crazy case. And that's why everyone, all of us anyway, are just hanging on every word and just waiting for what's going to happen next. And I will tell you what's going to happen next in a minute. Um, thanks, Birdwatcher, for being a member for one month. How can Bev rule on a motion to recuse Bev? What? Yep. It is made in front of the judge that you want to recuse. Bird, Bird Watcher, thanks again for another super chat. Melanie, reviewing these past documents is so helpful. Seeing Bev rule on that herself should not be recused is mind boggling. Does New York allow judges to rule on their own recusal? Usually it is made in front of the judge that you want to recuse. In fact, Clarence Thomas recently on the Supreme Court recused himself from the January 6th trial. So this has happened recently. It happens a lot. Judges recuse themselves. It's the right thing to do in the interest of justice and in the interest of the appearance of impropriety. Didn't happen here. You're awesome. Yes, there is AC in the courthouse. Thank you, Kat, for your super chat. Appreciate you, girl. Lisa, thanks for your super chat. Just for me and you. Thank you for this. Oh, thank you for this, Lisa. Thanks for watching. All of you, Laura, for your super chat. She's so infuriating. All of this is infuriating. Yes, it is. Laura says, and I live in LA, so I really have no connection or bias. Thank you, Laura. I really don't have any connection or bias too, other than I call it as I see it. I call it as I see it. And this is what I see. I see a woman who's being railroaded. And I say, where's the ring doorbell footage of her doing it? Like you said you had on February 2nd of 22. I keep going back to that. And, I can't, and, th and now we know that that 2.27 AM Google search, how long to die in cold, really did happen from Jen McCabe's phone at 2.27 AM. We know it really happened. Can't get past that either. Oh, and we know that an accident reconstruction expert with three PhDs that was attacked on court TV for saying those injuries did not come from a pedestrian versus car accident. Uh, I was attacked by someone who said, now everyone thinks they have a PhD because they look at these injuries and they say it happened from a dog. Well, I've been vindicated because a man with three PhDs said, mm. John, O'Keefe was not hit by a car and a car did not hit John O'Keefe. And that's not where those injuries came from. So my friends, we are coming back on March 20th. There is going to be a motion hearing, a rule 17 motion hearing. And that motion, that rule 17 motion was made by the defense for Brian Albert, Kenneth Berkowitz, Brian Higgins, Cell phone records from Verizon Sprint and Next Gen Metro PCS. So we're going to see what that's all about. I'm sure it has to do with what the FBI uncovered in their federal investigation of this investigation. That is going to happen on March 20th, which is in a couple of days. It's three days from now, Wednesday, I guess. Uh, then there's another motions hearing scheduled for March 26th. Final pretrial conference is April 12th, and the trial is still scheduled to start on April 16th of 2024. And I'm here for it. I'm here for it with you. So remember, my friends, please, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button, hitting the subscribe button, hit the bell. Those of you who are saying you did not get notifications, it may be because you do not have notifications enabled on your phone. Uh, so check that. Also, you can unsubscribe and then resubscribe. Sometimes that works. Make sure the bell is set to all notifications. It is free to subscribe. So please do that. It really helps the channel. It helps push this video out. We want everyone to know this information, don't we? And also, um, go subscribe to Aura for your free 14-day trial. And then let me know how you like it. Because if anybody's stalking you on the internet, 
Google yourself and you'll be afraid to know that they can find out everything about you because it's out there because data brokers sell your information and Aura will take care of that for you. They've done it for me. Also, I'd like to close tonight by saying this. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sunshine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. That, my friends, is the traditional Irish blessing on this St. Paddy's Day, 2024. Remember, be cool, be kind, be classy. It's not hard, you guys. It is really, really, really so not hard. Peace. I'll see you soon. Tomorrow I'll be in court for the Amityville Butchers, so watch for a show maybe tomorrow night on that. Take care, everyone. Have a great night.